showed a little bit of code. Um, I'd created a Telegram bot um, that we were using to track who was going to be attending some events. Um, our soccer group here at ThoughtWorks uses it to see who's coming every, every week. Um, so the, the functionality of the... I'll just go over this very quickly again to show people that may not have been here. Um, you can start a roll call in a chat group. Um, hopefully the bot's listening. So it just uh, acknowledges that. Um, and then you can declare who is in. Um, re records me as coming. Um, oh, Christian's responded. So Christian's coming as well. And then I might say I'm out because I'm injured. Um, for example. Um, so it's kind of useful. Um, the original version of this was done, uh, I think the original one was done with Phoenix and then I refactored it to get rid of Phoenix because it didn't need Phoenix at all. Um, and I rewrote it. Um, but it was using a relational database. It was using a Postgres database to persist all the data. Um, and that's fine and that's still the production version. But um, I was thinking about it and I wanted something that was, I wanted a project to just play with Elixir and I decided to keep iterating over this. Um, there was a few problems I wanted to address. First of all, I felt the first version was really just a very normal app. Um, it took requests, processed them, stored some stuff in the database and responded. Um, it wasn't very uh, OTP. Um, it was not doing much in the way of managing processes, etc. Um, and I just wanted to find a, a challenge to, to use some of the, the cool things that Elixir provides. Um, so I came up with a plan. I, this is a little bit of an unprepared talk, so I don't have a diagram or anything. But um, firstly, I wanted to avoid having to register a new SSL certificate for every bot that I created. Um, so I thought I could have one uh, system that received web requests and then delegated it off to other systems to actually handle it. So I could have um, what I've called it is the, the, the bot hub. So there's, <laughs> there's, there's one, um, one master system that, handle, that takes incoming requests and then it can farm it out to, to other, other applications. So these are actually running in separate Erlang VMs at the moment. So we're actually getting communication across Erlang VMs. Um, and within, that VM, within the VM that is handle, actually handling the requests, um, I've got a couple of supervisors going on. Um, and I've got individual processes for each chat group. Um, so one of the ideas with a process in Elixir is that it just it maintains a state that it passes in. Every time you send a message to the process, it will have the, the state that the process last responded the last time it handled a message. So this implementation that I've just demonstrated here, it no longer has a relational database that is storing the, the data. Um, everything is just an in-memory state. Um, so if currently this version, if this, the process for this particular chat group dies, it will lose its state. Um, I'm ho hoping to do another version where I will start persisting it to, to disk, I think, just for each chat group when it receives a message or something similar. Um, I'm looking into uh, DETS. So this version is using ETS tables, um, but there is a disk version of ETS tables. Um, ETS is Erlang term storage. Um, so I'll jump into some of the code. Um, if, you, if you haven't looked at OTP, it's probably going to be a bit hard to follow some of this stuff. Um, I'll try and explain it as best I can. Um, so I'm not going to bother showing you the bot hub. Um, we'll just focus on the, an individual bot that lives inside the hub. <laughs> um, the, the first thing that this um, application does is it spawns a worker process. Um, that's the process that will receive messages from the bot hub. And those messages are, have already been deemed uh, applicable to this particular bot. Um, so it won't receive messages from any of the other bots. Um, it'll also have a chat group supervisor. Um, 
The chat group supervisor is responsible for starting processes for each individual chat group that it receives a message for. Um, so I'll show you the worker. Um, basically, when this process first starts up, um, it connects to the hub. Um, to do that, uh, I'm getting, I'm using, uh, where is it? I'm using an Erlang um, library here. This is actually sort of built into Erlang. Um, it's, uh, there's no library involved here where I can register the name of this process um, globally. Um, and when it means globally, it's not just within the single VM, it's across VMs. So I've already joined um, another VM here. So Connector Hub actually gets the, the node name of my Bot Hub VM um, and will connect to that <coughs> node. Um, so then I register this process with that node so the Bot Hub knows where to send messages. Um, when I receive an actual telegram message, um, I'll, I'll receive it into this process first. Uh, at the moment, this process is responsible for passing the JSON of that message into a, uh, a structure. Um, and then I basically pass it off to an individual chat group process um, that's going to manage all the messages for that chat group. Um, we can at this point jump in and have a look at the chat group. Um, so there's a chat group. This is another gen server. Um, and um, hang on. when you call handle message on the chat group um, module, it looks for the chat group process, which may or may not exist yet. If it's the first message, um, it, it won't exist. Um, I can just jump down to the code down below and be say, OK, it looks up where is the chat group with that ID. Um, this is using local process registration. So all of these processes are only known within this Erlang VM. Um, and if it doesn't find one, it creates a new chat group process and returns the PID for that process. Um, otherwise, it returns the other PID. Um, fairly simple. Uh, actually handling um, the message once it's found the process. Um, so this is where we're sending the message to the process itself. Um, and this is where it is handled. Um, I have a message handler, which I kind of showed the, the two um, meetups ago. Um, this has been refactored to remove all of the persistence stuff. Um, and I, I really like this now because like, it's very, very clean and simple. Um, we're using a, a lot of pattern matching in here to match all the different methods, uh, sorry, uh, commands that the, the bot supports. Um, and it's, it's really pretty simple. Um, I'll go back to chat group. So the, the, the actual chat group process is pretty simple. It actually handles the message. Um, if the response to that is OK, um, it saves the state in ETS. Um, so uh, here. The reason it's doing this at the moment is if this process dies, it will still reload the, the state of the process. Um, my bigger issue here is if the whole VM crashes, then I lose the state. But as long as the VM doesn't go down, well, actually, that's not quite true. If my supervisor doesn't go down, but my supervisor is very, very simple. So all it does is spawn child process. It's very, very unlikely that that will go down. But if the whole VM goes down, then I will lose state. Um, uh, so yeah, loading and storing state in these ETS tables. The interfaces for this is really simple. Um, and this is all built in to Elixir. Well, I mean, this is really a, an Erlang library. Um, you can look up, um, this is the name of the ETS instance. Um, and I'm looking things up based on the process name um, for my chat group. Um, what you can store in there is really like a, a, a tuple. So you can put whatever you like. It uses the first item um, as your lookup key. Um, so in my case, the first item when I'm saving state is my process name. And then I actually store my state. Um, 
my state refers to uh, a struct I've defined that stores um, the information about the chat group and all the responses that it's received. Um, I don't want to ramble on too much about this stuff um, because I've sort of jumped all over the place and probably confused everyone so far. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I'd love to answer them. Um, and if anyone's got any suggestions on how I can make it better, that, that's good too. Uh, one question, so the ETS you use is just memory mode, right? It doesn't save yes. the disk. How do you configure it to save information to the disk? Is it um, just I've only tried this once, and I've actually just had to stash it for this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sort of finish it. But basically, it is as simple as renaming all of the ETS atoms to DETS. And it will just, it's a, it's a different module that is totally compatible with all the same functions. Um, but rather than store it in memory, it will actually write it to disk. The only difference, um, give me one second. Uh, hang on, let's just do it here. Um, So you can see I've got DTS, DTS, mm -hmm. DETS, sorry. Um, this, so when you first create it, uh, too small. All right, hang on. It's, I don't know. I don't think I can in this app. Um, hold on, let's do, why not? Uh, where was that? That was in chat group supervisor. Hold on. So this is the line that we were trying to read. Um, this is the only one that really had to change after I made the switch um, because I had to provide uh, a file name for where it was actually going to store it. Um, so I'm not sure if that's the way forward. Um, I was going to try this out. Um, from what I've read, it's significantly slower. Um, Can you make it faster for DTS and set it to have like a um, sort of RAM disk? I think there's a mode for it so that it actually stores everything in memory and whenever you write, it keeps a copy in memory as well. Yeah. Okay. So when you read, it's actually very fast. So yeah. the little bit of research I've done so far um, was pointing me towards the um, Amnesia library. I don't know if it's a library. I think is that, that's part of Erlang as well, I think, um, which basically seems to just be a layer on top of ETS and DETS. And I think that... Yeah. yeah, so I haven't tried that yet, but um, I'm, I'm curious to give that a try. Um, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning, the, the reason that I'm okay with it uh, being in memory at the moment is because I was playing around with eDeliver, which allows you to do deployments without restarting the VM. So the zero downtime deployments and upgrades. Um, I. I have that configured in this project, and I have it also configured through Snap CI. So essentially, every commit will build an upgrade, an update uh, binary, and push that to the server. And it, at the moment, it, unfortunately, it's not automatically running the upgrade script. But I think I'm pretty close to getting that functional. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble eventually because I'll change. It gets complex when you're trying to upgrade a running process, right? But if you, if you, yeah, if you, def if you change the state of the process in an incompatible way, the whole thing's going to crash. Um, you can write upgrade scripts, etc. But at the moment, I'm kind of just assuming a happy path. <laughs> Is that a lot of people doesn't know that Erlang allows live code upgrades? Yeah. It yes. supports out of the box. Shut Yeah. 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 It's a very cool feature of Erlang and Elixir. Um, and if you're doing deployments, uh, definitely look into eDeliver. Um, I can talk about this for a few minutes. How long, how long do we have? I'll try and limit this to five minutes, just give a really quick overview. Um, there is a library called eDeliver. Um, it's sort of based on top of the XRM, um, which is a uh, release management library as well. Um, so EXRM actually builds the binary, and eDeliver kind of is kind of like Capistrano is in Rails. 
Um, it's just got a bunch of scripts that help you actually deploy the, the binaries that EXRM creates. Um, the, the deployment process is as easy as these few commands. So mix, e-deliver, build, or release. Um, at the moment, I'm on a, a particular branch. Um, and then the, an important thing to know here is that when you build the release, um, you have to build it on the same platform that you're going to deploy it to because it contains the actual Erlang runtime, I think. <laughs> um, so if you built it on a Mac and then tried to deploy it to a Linux server, it would not work. Um, eDeliver makes that easy. Um, in a config file, you can provide your build host. So in my case, my build host is the exact same thing as my production host. So it actually builds it on the production box, um, delivers it back to me as a binary, and then I deploy it back to the production box. In a real setup, you would not be doing that. You'd have a proper build box and deploy to a separate machine. Um, yeah, no, I think there's a lot of people that are talking about that at the moment, but that doesn't exist in... It's because you, it's, con, it's actually embedding the compiled version of Erlang, essentially, in your release, so you get a single release binary. Yeah. Um, but it's already been compiled specific to that platform. Yeah. Um, you, you must know that um, for XRM, when you release it, the binary itself contains everything. It's standalone, including the whole beam VM and everything. Yeah, that's why when it compiles on the platform itself, it's very platform specific. Yeah. Yeah. How are you dealing with uh, like some secret keys when deploying? Where do you keep them? I have I have this problem in my app. Yeah, yeah. I'm still kind of working through this one myself. Yeah. Um, I you have, have obviously this problem as well. <coughs> I mean, so so just recently I've added Conform, um, which is a good library to manage the configuration because I found it very painful. The original config is done in uh, like Erlang config file, which mm -hmm. is kind of like this. This is just my template for me for, for a reference. Mm -hmm. but you essentially have to create this manually on the server. Um, it now looks more like uh, in my config folder. There's a um, it's like a proper configuration file. That, um, and how do you later? Load this Basically, configuration. When like I create my server and I deploy this thing for the first time, I, at the moment I actually have to SSH into the server and put the configuration into the file. Okay. Um, but does Erlen have an eval? Sorry? Does Erlen have an eval? Eval, the eval function. I uh, have no idea. Like run a piece of string as code? Um, no, no, yes. Because you would have to have also a compiler included in your build, right? It's a yeah. compiled language. Ah, yes. Okay. Well, that's usually that's what used for uh, for uh, configuration file. No, so this is I think it replaces just some placeholder in the code with the value. I think it, this is done on compilation level, right? This is replaced. There, there on is a, I think conform itself is another whole. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, there is, there's a lot of different things going on there. They've actually got a schema file. Well, if you compile the thing on the target, then you can put some secret there. You don't have to put it in the code base. And so the secret is actually compiled into your uh, binary. Yes. 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 Um, yeah, well, but there's, there's pros and cons of this. I mean, it's like if you are using Phoenix and you're using Phoenix configuration files, right? Mm. It doesn't work very well. XRM. Yeah, I haven't tried this with Phoenix, yeah. I'm sort of avoiding Phoenix for the time being. Yeah. I know it's a good web framework, yeah. but I've got no need to it. So. Yeah. So so if you if you don't want to deal with this, this is really good if you are trying to build a release and you do hot code upgrade, this is where the value yeah. is. But if you don't want to deal with all this complexity, you can just run your code. You can clo GitHub clone on the server and you can run it no problem at all. It will run, it will work. And it is in this way so called cross platform. Yeah, just shipping the source code over. Yeah, this makes it yeah. really easy. Like, there's, there's no real requirements for your server. Mm -hmm. 
um, you can deploy a binary straight to it. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I have to set up a configuration file, yeah. but it will basically run with no dependencies. Yeah. But there's a few caveats because in uh, Phoenix, we are so used to like getting system environments, right? But yeah. if you compile this, it's actually grabbing the system environments of the build machine because mm -hmm. it, it is actually compiled into bytecode mm -hmm. for the configurations. It's not grabbing the system environments when you're on the machine, when you run it. Yeah, yeah, in terms of your config file, if you put something like this in there, yep. yes, that, that doesn't work. That's why you need something that's going to load a config file on when your, your application starts up in your production environment. Yep. Um, Conform is good because it gives you this, this is a little bit sort of complicated for a simple configuration, but you can have a schema. Um, so when it loads your config file in production, it will give you a bunch of validations about whether the configuration is correct. Um, you can have required properties, uh, you can set all sorts of things in here. And that's just very good for, like, if you hand this binary off to somebody and they have to configure it themselves, it gives them feedback on whether the configuration is correct or not. So, yeah, I mean, check it out. All this stuff is available on GitHub if you're interested at all. Um, that's all. Getting rid of compiler warnings and stuff so far. Um, that's cool. 